for some businesses, it might be the right time to hit a reset button and understand, yeah. well, how do I want to do this? Am I okay continuing to have the challenges where my calculations, my you know, everything I have in my model makes so much sense to me. But when it comes to reality, one month I'm over, one month I'm <laughs> under on a seasonal basis, maybe it's okay, maybe annual basis it's okay. But yeah. what, what, what good is having the right annual number if you're yeah. on a month by month basis, you're either not meeting your customer's demand, losing revenue. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now... Here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm Elevate IQ. Each industry has its own unique supply chain challenges irrespective of whether you are in the manufacturing industry or construction. In the case of construction, You have a long sales cycle and demanding projects where you need to make sure you have suppliers lined up as soon as the project closes. The supply chain disruptions might result in delays with your projects, lost relationships with other business partners, and cash flow. In today's episode, our guest, Bahadir Ardem, who shares his insights into the supply chain issues and processes for construction, building material, and roofing industry. He also provides his insights into the supply chain processes, into how the supply chain processes differ, and unique forecasting challenges for these industries. Finally, he discusses several other supply chain concepts, such as stock outs, skew rationalization, and recent supply chain challenges. Let me introduce Bahadir to you. Bahadir is a procurement and supply chain leader with 20 years of experience sourcing products and services in building materials, construction, power generation, including nuclear and fossil power plants and manufacturing. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hey, Bahadir, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam. Uh, th- thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. And I am super excited as well because the kind of insights that you are going to bring from the supply chain perspective, obviously, that is one of the pressing issues uh, that everyone is facing right now. So I think it's going to be super meaningful for our audience. Just to kick things off, Bahadi, do you want to start with your personal story and your current focus? Exactly. Perfect. So so I'm an industrial engineer with an MBA uh, okay. early on in my career as my uh, first role. I was actually lucky enough to be a part of a re- leadership development program, which gave me a chance to dip my toe in different parts of running a business. Very and cool. I very quickly uh, noticed that I was good at and I felt very passionate about building relationships with suppliers yep. and uh, adding value through you know negotiations with, uh, uh, with with supplier partners finding win-win opportunities and so on so uh, I really enjoyed that and ultimately uh, decided to you know see t- test myself in in, in in different organizations so uh, made a switch to uh, to a construction company yep. in their power business units working yep. with nuclear and Fossil burning power plants, yeah, uh, large projects uh, that 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 have heavy oversight from from re- re- regulative bodies, you know, in line with EPA regulations and things of that nature, yeah, and gave me a great perspective on construction space, what kind of uh, supply chain and procurement principles need to apply there, yeah, uh, for very large dollar amount uh, subcontracts, and ultimately, at my last employer, uh, I was responsible for manufacturing and purchasing building materials, uh, primarily roofing, specifically yeah. roofing, yeah. and and had a chance to really build great relationships with suppliers, understand uh, supply challenges, yeah. and get the business to, uh, you know, help help drive the business to satisfy the customer needs, as Very well cool. as improve profitability. So uh, my, in terms of current focus, uh, I mean, my goal really is helping organizations grow by focusing on Profitability, that's one. Uh, customer focus and customer experience. Uh, and lastly, 
uh, human experience within the organization. Very, very, very interesting. And I think, you know, when we think of supply chain and when I have these conversations with my supply chain peers, uh, typically they are thinking about, you know, retail, manufacturing. Uh, you know, I have not come across anybody who really talks about building material and construction. Uh, so it's going to be really interesting to dig into what kind of supply chain challenges are uh, are going to be there in the construction and building material space. So you have a very unique experience. Before we do that, we have one of these standard questions that we ask every single guest that come on the show. And that is going to be, Bahadir, your perspective on business growth. Perfect, perfect. Well, growth is, uh, in my perspective, growth is evolution, right? It's okay. uh, understanding how you got from point A to point Z, yeah. all the decisions that you made in order to get there, yeah. what outcomes, uh, what the outcomes have been, positive or negative, taking stock, understanding what decisions could have been made differently yeah. to get you to a better place, right? So, so it's, uh, it's all about con uh, continuous develop, continuous improvement, yeah. and, and finding ways to, to improve the organization. So if we, if we were to think about, you know, the current challenges that we're facing following, yeah. let's say, you know, COVID, right? 75% yep, yep. uh, of the businesses out there are challenged with supply chain constraints, not being able to get the right materials at the right time from their uh, suppliers, right? So right. massive pain, huge yep. pain. And uh, frankly, it's probably a growing pain, right? It's going to separate the companies that are going to grow and be able to leverage new methods, new thoughts, new yep. ways of thinking, yep. and get so much stronger in light of this, in light of this, uh, you know, challenging environment that we're passing through. Frankly, I, I, I think we're at a inflection point where businesses are going to be separated from who are the Netflixes and who are the blockbusters in, yeah. in, in their area by by really uh, taking on new challenges and finding new ways to do things. Very cool. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be really interesting, and I completely agree that the current challenges are definitely making it harder for the businesses and the companies that are doing slight things slightly differently, whether they are trying to innovate from the marketing positioning perspective, or whether they are trying to do differently from the supply chain or technical capabilities perspective. All of those are going to be the competitive advantage and uh, the companies that are really capital capitalizing on these things are probably going to win. So obviously, you know, when I have any sort of guest on this podcast, what I am typically looking for is the trends. Okay, each industry, each company is unique. When you talk about supply chain, supply chain functions, uh, the process may look very similar. A lot of people might argue that, you know what, supply chain is the same, whether you go from your food production to your manufacturing, to your construction, to building material. But Bahadir, you have done this, okay? And you have lived this life. You know in your heart how hard it gets with every single business because they are going to have the different contracts. They are going to have different vendor arrangements. Uh, they are going to have different sort of constraints from the supply chain perspective. They are going to have different ways of defining their SKUs. So what I'm looking from you is, let's say you have been in three industries really. So when you look at construction, building materials, and roofing, okay, what are the differences that you have seen in terms of the supply chain? If you could talk about maybe at the SKU level, maybe uh, at the, the forecasting level, that's going to be super meaningful. You know, let's say if somebody is trying to get into the, these industries and they just don't know what to expect, it's going to be super helpful for them. Sure, sure, sure. So, so you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that uh, the same principles and the same methodologies in terms of supply chain and procurement could be applied from industry to industry, you right. know, changing the uh, changing product from product A to product B. However, as you said, uh, there are definitely nuances from company to company and from yeah. industry to industry that could make it very, uh, you know, it, it could make it challenging for somebody that that that's a newcomer to the to the industry or that uh, or uh, you know, as as the dynamics of the business change, it, it might create opportunities where 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 companies and people need to evolve, right? So. From an overall supply chain standpoint, it's uh, similar in the aspect that you you have still a global supply chain okay. of raw material suppliers, right? Yeah. You have uh, your key raw materials that might be coming from uh, different parts of the world, different parts of the globe. Yeah. Uh, you have manufacturers or intermediaries that make potentially specialty chemicals or specialty products yeah. using some of these raw materials. Uh, that will ultimately be used as uh, in, in production of the final product. And then manufacturers that build uh, the, the finished product, right? And one thing that's pretty typical in the building materials yeah. space and you know, on the construction side of the business, I, I had to deal with this very often as well, is from a channel to, to the, 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 the last channel, the last step of, this, of the chain 
uh, where the product goes to the customer could yeah. be a distributor. Okay. If you're a very large job, if you're a very large company working on uh, multiple projects or very large large projects, yeah. you could be getting your product directly from the manufacturer. Right. Or in the case of uh, you know homeowners or people li- that like to you know work on their rental property or things of that nature by themselves, then there's always the option of big box retail, right? So, so uh, that, that, that's where I think the, the main differentiation happens in terms of the, uh, as, as you get closer to the customer, the yeah. options of how you could uh, get, get access to the product is different. And then the end customer, depending on the, the product category, yeah. it could be a contractor, yeah. It could be a company uh, that's that's a, you know, a large construction company, yeah. or it could be uh, a, a DIY uh, customer, just like me and you working in our yeah. homes over the weekends, right? So the way uh, to to satisfy all of those businesses are, are are very very different. So if I'm a customer, yeah. I need to be able to purchase at a reasonable cost at at lo- small quantities. Yeah. If I'm a contractor, I'm gonna want to buy. Uh, large quantities on a consistent basis with uh, uh, with partnerships that would utilize my commitment to the business, to the company, yeah. and uh, however, allowing me to differentiate my product portfolio that I'm selling my customers by having some complements as well yeah. as some alternatives, comp- competitive alternatives to to the product that I'll be getting from company A. If 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 the target is large constructor like the, the the company that i worked at yeah then uh, you have enough jobs out there okay uh, that you already have a volume benefits that, that, that you could get however jobs are much longer the projects yeah. are much longer you're talking yeah. about as opposed to you know on a weekend somebody coming and replacing someone's roof in, within within a few hours to a three-year project yeah. where uh, relationships matter continuity of supply matters conflicts yeah. come up right in terms of uh, disagreements on what, what what the costs were, as 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 uh, as the prices, as the uh, industry, as the economy changes, it could be inflation, it could be supply and demand yeah. uh, changes that 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 drive price differences. Things will be different for a co- uh, for a company that's actually doing the construction and what their needs are. Right. So so I would say from an overall supply chain standpoint, while it's very similar to a lot of the a lot of manufacturers in the sense yeah. that it's a global supply chain. Yeah. As you get closer to the to the end customer, the differentiation happens. Okay, very interesting. So obviously, you know, in my case, when I think of these industries, and I am always trying to compare the business model, and typically business model is what drives uh, the complexity of whether you are talking about supply chain or whether you are talking about ERP processes, you know, which are closely interrelated in my experience, right? So when I look at the construction, as the uh, as you know, we are in the ERP business. For us, the construction is a very different beast in general. Mm-hmm. So even the way you are describing right now the construction business, you mentioned you know you have a bunch of uh, contractors, uh, you have GPs, uh, general contractors, DCs, not GPs, and then uh, you know you are going to have your large construction companies. Uh, you are going to have your independent contractors that are actually driving you. If you actually try to compare this with the uh, traditional manufacturing or distribution value chain, they have similar sort of you know value chain. But the place where I really find the differences, and we typically, when we are going as the ERP solution, you know, if there is going to be a manufacturing or distribution solution, we don't try to implement that in the construction business because construction business is very, 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 very unique. And I'll tell you some of the uniqueness of the construction business. The project that you mentioned that they are really long standing in need. Okay. So those projects are going to have many different parties. They are competing. You are having submittals. You have a little bit of collab- collaboration. So obviously the pre-sale process is very long. Now that could happen in case of your engineering shop as well, that you are trying to collaborate with the customer, but you don't have as many uh, stakeholders involved overall in terms of the collaboration. Now, in my mind, when I look at this arrangement, that should actually drive your supply chain because you don't know what you are going to, going to get uh, at the end of the day. Well, you know, how much pie you are going to get from the deal, you know, what is going to be your, your demand, and then you, know, you have to plan your supply as well. So when you look at this, this uh, the whole sales model, have you seen any specific challenges in the construction industry because of this whole process of construction that I just... Yeah, yeah, I, th- I, th- I think the big one probably is the sudden spikes Okay. And 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 sudden uh, sudden spikes in pricing that might be experienced, as well as sudden shortage of supply. Okay. So let's say you are building an extension to a 
power plant where yeah. you're going to be cleaning up the uh, gases that this power plant is emitting to the to the to, to the atmosphere. And yeah. you have, to your point, a three-year project. You need structural steel. Yeah. And when you know in the in the begin, beginning of the project, you do your you know you do your competitive bidding. Yeah. You get bids. You have your you know obviously as you said uh, the engineering team, the architecture team. There there's a lot of legwork that needs to happen upfront yeah. yeah. to understand. Even when the general contractor is bidding on the job, they need to do some of this work in order to put a competitive bid, yeah. which is going to be profitable for them, uh, but appealing to the to the to the to the building owner, to the job owner, right? Yeah. To the yeah. to the utility. In my in the experience, uh, in, in my experience, right? So so there are many points where supply chain and and, and procurement, I guess, need to interface with the the, the, the engineering teams uh, and and project management. To make yeah. sure that the scope of the job, the drawings design is 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 the same. It's okay. it, and if it, it as it changes, uh, the, the right changes need to be made to the uh, to, to the request from the supplier. Uh, then later on, let's say you know in the example that we were just talking about, it's a three-year project. Let's say yeah, and you have uh, done your due diligence, you have gone through your bid reviews, and you now have selected one supplier that you feel is offering you the best price, best okay. service, lowest amount of risk. However, some global issue happens. Let's yeah. say, I mean, anything I don't even happen. know what the next one is going to be. But right? any, I mean, I, th I think last few years has showed us anything yeah. could happen at yeah. any time that's going to yeah. impact companies and their supply chains. That, that's why resilience, I think, is going to be what's going to differentiate companies yeah. from companies. Yeah. And in the light of, of, of those external impacts, let's say your supplier that was the best supplier now cannot source their steel to make your structural steel. Right? Yeah. I think the challenges that the companies are experiencing now and that they have experienced over the past few years has been specifically around not being able to get their hands on the, 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 the right products at, yeah. at, at the right time and at the right price, right? Because th th those three are the, to the, are the critical aspects. And to answer your question, the, in, a, in a more succinct way, I guess. The right way to, I believe, manage that, for the case of a general contract, is frankly a little more challenging yeah, than yeah. if you were just a manufacturer that, that could make contracts with many different companies as backup suppliers, right? But as a, as a, as a, as a general contractor, you have to make a, a contract and you, and, and you have to have an agreement in place with a steel manufacturer, but yeah. you can't go and make another agreement with somebody else for a, on undisclosed amount of material just because they need to know what they need. And sure. if there's lack of clarity, then there's going to be upstream challenges on, yeah. on, on getting the supply, which is ultimately, ultimately going to fail everyone, right? So, so I, think, I think the critical thing is building very solid, strong relationships with the parties that you're using as your partners, yeah. understanding uh, what their challenges could be as they face those challenges or as they have inclinations of any of those challenges, having very clear and concise communication and being able to collectively address those issues as opposed to you know sweeping things under the rug and waiting for well maybe the steel prices will come down and maybe maybe we'll be able to meet this job and then in, in the case of a you know large construction company having to deal with liquidated damages because of because of delays uh, i mean you, then you're talking about a project that could make you a lot of profit to a project that could potentially put your business under just yeah. just, just because you're not going to be able to service it in terms of a smaller company I mean, the example that I gave is, is, is was was for a larger manufacturer, a larger yeah. constructor. For 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 smaller uh, manufacturers, I think the same principles will apply. Yeah. Relationships and 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 managing that relationship with your potential suppliers or the supplier that you ultimately sign the contract with is going to be the most important thing. The challenge, though, is going to be you're probably not going to have as much opportunity to interface with them because you're going to be a much smaller component of their uh, customer portfolio as opposed to being a large subcontractor that's going to be you know, purchasing tens of millions of dollars of material uh, in the next few years, right? So, so, so I think there's going to be more onus that's going to be on the, on the uh, companies to track the trends, get really connected, understand what the potential bottlenecks could be, yeah. and do their own due diligence to know when and how to reach out to the right parties. Okay, very interesting. So obviously, you know, when we go through this process, and I like your comment about the relationships, uh, but in my experience, when you are working with very large customers, you are probably not going to have as, as much cloud. And the only way to please the relationship is going to be just keep doing what they are asking to do, uh, right? And in some cases, what that means is, let's say if you are working on these large projects, they are going to take forever to decide 
And obviously, if they are not going to decide, it's going to be really hard for you to plan your supply chain. But the day they actually pull the trigger, they want all of your people in line. They want all of your materials in line. And they want every single detail about the project, right? Now, that could be very challenging, obviously. Sure, you can manage the expectations by communication. But at the same time, they are looking to see the pro. So in your experience, so let's say if you're looking at the overarching picture of planning that, okay, I'm competing in, let's say, I don't know, man, 500 deals. Out of 500, maybe you win 50. I don't know how many, you know, you would typically win in the construction space. But you have to plan based on how many deals you have in pipeline, because they all are going to demand some sort of supply, some sort of suppliers that are going to be providing these services. So you need to plan it out. So what has been your method, let's say, if you were to plan for this kind of business, are you going to plan in the pre-sale space? Are you going to wait till the order is going to be closed and then you run to your supplier? So how have you managed to plan uh, with so much uncertainty in this space? I think, I think, uh, I think it kind of goes back to the answer that you asked earlier, the first question, the, the, the growth question, right? Yeah. And, and it's, it's, I, I think it's all about continuously keeping each other abreast of the situation, right? So, so I know you said communication could be challenging, specifically for a smaller company, uh, or that much communication on a, on a continuous basis. Uh, but uh, in the bid phase, you, yeah. you need to have yeah. you know communication. Then, then as as things get closer to the starting of the job and contract, uh, or not even there, uh, in, in the bid review phase, uh, you, you need to have uh, more discussion. You're constantly having to reassess the situation and realign what you are uh, gonna have to, as as a as a, constru- as a constructor as the general contractor you're constantly in a position to re- reassess what is going to cost you yeah and how you need to face your your customer and uh, set the proper expectations about the ch- challenges and changes that are out there right so while I know it's, uh, I mean, w- w- one thing to do is, and this is this is what we utilize at my last uh, em- employer uh, pretty successfully. Yeah. There, there are a lot of indices out there. Yeah. There, there are a lot of indices uh, that that track costs of of certain products, right? So, so as opposed to opening Wall Street Journal or opening Bloomberg or you know some some other publication on a daily basis, minute by minute, trying to see what the steel prices are. Yeah. You could you could you could on a monthly basis see what see what what the prices are doing, and uh, you could you could subscribe to these are not high cost subscriptions either. If you could subscribe to industry uh, newsletters or industry uh, information channels where, where, where you could get forecasted pricing on certain products, right? Over a course of period. Uh, and and you, could, you could utilize those, you could put together pricing formulas that, that they take into account uh, the costs in those determine what is a reasonable amount of risk that you could take on. Yeah. Uh, however, you could still remain a viable solution to the to, to the to the company that's trying to uh, get the building done okay very interesting so obviously the price is going to be one factor but you know when you are committing for something you need to deliver as well right so getting the supplies is going to be another challenge so as we know i mean the deal is always going to have uncertainty and it's very 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 hard to get clear answers uh, you know from the sales team because they don't know what is going to happen to them so at what point do you plan to forecast what is the so let's say if you were to work with another construction and you were to design their supply chain maybe they were all over the place they source everything uh, the local supplies they don't really have the supply chain processes that wine and they are trying to establish some standard because obviously now they are growing and they need to figure out okay how to scale this because if you are going to be operating in a very ad hoc basis where okay i wait for the contract then i figure out okay where are my suppliers let me talk to them if they are able to supply and then i'll deliver you will not be able to scale using that method uh, the majority of the you know small to medium sized businesses they are probably going to be working in this method but as you know if you want to scale you have to define uh, you know procurement processes you have to have confidence in your forecasting so what would be your approach let's say if i ask you okay you have the sales uncertainty you have a lot of different stakeholders that are driving the uh, you have very little uh, you know un- uh, certainty in terms of what is going to close but that is actually going to drive your demand and finally that is going to drive your supply so how would you approach this, let's say, if you were to consult with a, a small company that is trying to streamline their supply chain process in the... Yeah, I mean, forecasting in the construction space is 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 is, is, a, is a challenge, right? I mean, forecasting for specific SKUs in a, yeah. in a, in a manufacturing environment, 
are, uh, I mean, you have your, your, your historicals, you have your, you know, you could, you, you have your tools that you could use that would help you with demand sensing. And yeah. you have a large enough sales organization where you can understand what's going on on the, uh, on the front lines in terms of customers needs. Uh, when it comes to, um, uh, uh, a construction company, I think those challenges are um, different, right? I mean, yep. you have, I'm sure you, you would have access to the number of jobs at certain sizes yep. that, that, that would drive, when I say sizes, like dollar amounts or, you know, the, the footprint of the job, that, 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 that would give you a sense of, uh, you know, similar to new, house, new housing starts or, 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 or other, other metrics where, where it could give you a sense of what kind of jobs and what kind of need in the industries out there. And I mean, I, I'm I'm assuming that would probably be the the the, the best way to 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 forecast what kind of construction jobs might be out there. I'm I'm also assuming if if uh, I mean, like to the point you made earlier, construction jobs typically take uh, a, a long amount of time, right? Yeah. It doesn't. It's not a. Uh, it's not a. I decide to build a building today, and tomorrow tomorrow it's up. Uh, so so I think networking into the right uh, organizations, right groups, it could be. You know, in the case of a, a, a small construction company, it could be networking with the local chamber of commerce, understanding what, what are the development opportunities that are there. If it's a larger company, then, then you know, subscribing to, 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 to industry groups uh, in the specific, I guess, construction space that, that, that is your core competency. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, all about, it's all about getting the right information at the right time for you to make the, 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 the right decision. I mean, that's the nature of forecasting, right? That's forecasting as a whole. Uh, it could be, you know, precision is, is something concerning when it comes to forecasting, yeah. right? When you, when you, when you, when you, when you try to get, uh, very precise, you could lose some accuracy. Yeah. Uh, when you, when, when, when you're, for, you know, for example, if you're forecasting on a, on a product category level, yeah. uh, your, your numbers are going to be probably much more closer than if you were to try to target, uh, right. how many red sweatshirts in me- medium size I'm going to sell versus how yeah. many sweatshirts I'm going to sell. Right. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, I mean, I think I, getting access to that right information is, is, is going to be the most, most critical, uh, way to, way to make, make those decisions. And then you're going to need to put your own spin in terms of what, what are risks that, that, that you're willing to encounter and you're, you're expecting to take on. Okay, so very interesting. So I like your example about, you know, uh, forecasting at the product category level versus at, actually at the product level. So I actually recorded one of the episodes with one of the guys that were in the CPG space, and we had some interesting learnings in that uh, episode. And one of the key learnings were the reason why they were getting these stock outs for the specific product, because they were actually forecasting at the product category level. But then they, they would have a lot of, uh, you know, specific product that were not selling, but then they would not have the products that were selling uh, in that product category. So even though they were forecasting at the product category level, but they were always, you know, misaligned overall at the product level, they had too much inventory for the sizes or the colors that were not selling. (laughs) They didn't have enough inventory for the ones that were selling. So have you seen anything similar in your space when you forecast, obviously, at the product category level? Your job is probably going to be easier, uh, but have you seen any similar issues in your space because of forecasting at the product category? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as it's nature, forecasting is an inaccurate science, right? <laughs> uh, and that's that's uh, the, the 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 critical thing is getting close enough. Yeah, uh, making, the, making the right decisions, having sound decisions in place, and and having the right processes in place that 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 are allowing you to get to the right numbers. So so products that are you know, in, 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 the, in, the, in the case of, uh, you know, building materials, products that are critical in many industries yeah. are, have, have, have been the ones that, that, that we had. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about raw materials, uh, yeah. but I could also speak about uh, end, end products as well. Yeah. So, so, so from a raw material perspective, products that are critical in other industries have been the difficult ones to, to, to source, right? Because depending on, uh, amount, depending on profitability or depending on the customer size, yeah. let's say you're, you know, you're, you're, you're competing you know, insulation. Let's talk yeah. about uh, foam insulation. Yeah, uh, yeah. That same product, you might remember, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, there was a shortage on foam mattresses, and some companies that were expected to do really well yeah. underperformed. Yeah. And uh, you know, we all remember uh, stories that we heard about uh, auto manufacturers. I mean, the stories that we mainly heard were about the chip shortage, 
but they also had shortages uh, where they were not able to make uh, seats for their cars because yeah. they weren't able to source the right raw materials to make the make the foam. Yeah. Right. So so you know that happens to be the the, the key raw materials in, in in those products seem to be the same ones uh, that are used as primary uh, manufacturing components of insulation in the in the building materials space. Right. So yeah. then all of a sudden you're finding yourself in a situation where you're having to compete against these big manufacturers of global industries I know. and the product product is in, in shortage and it just becomes a matter of whoever is going to and whoever is willing to pay the the the, the most amount of money to get it uh, soonest right yeah, yeah yeah so forecasting is one now forecasting has, is, is is also a double double edged sword right so so i'm i'm I, I'm sorry. I, I I I don't I don't think I watched that specific episode on the on the CPG uh, yeah. example that you gave. But you know, think about toilet papers during the pandemic. Yeah. Could anybody have expected running out of toilet paper had the pandemic not come up? No. You know, similar things are you know similar things happen in, in every industry, right? So the products that are the most critical and the products that are deemed the ones that might be most difficult to find. Yeah. Are the ones that are going to have inherent runs at by 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 people because they're they're you know they want to make sure that they have new supply of it. Now what does that happen? Now you have a supply and demand curve. Yeah. All of a sudden you're 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 shifting artificially the demand and it's shifting where it intersects with the supply curve, the prices yeah. and everything else is 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 at an entirely different place, right? So, in terms of in terms of forecasting, getting a good understanding of why certain things happen, right? Yeah. So. Again, let's say let's 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 use that. I, I know it's not a building material related industry, but I, I feel yeah. that the toilet paper is such a good example to, 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 <laughs> to prove the point. Yeah. But 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 let's say you know a company is looking at their historicals. Yeah. And in 2022, they look at their 2021 March toilet paper sales. And yeah. Like, Man. Okay, we need to get ready for this heavy season because we're gonna have you know we have right. seasonal <laughs> historicals. Yep. Where yep. you know. We're, we're going to make a lot of money. Yep, Let's yep, make yep. all the toilet paper we can. And yep. all of a sudden you find yourself yep. <laughs> swimming in it because the demand right. has normalized. Yep. Right. So, so I, I, I think that's where it becomes a, an, an inaccurate science. Right. Yeah. Uh, what I found really interesting yeah. about, about forecasting and, and using technology is I actually came across a McKinsey article last week. Yeah. And spreadsheets are still by far the dominant tool companies are using for 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 forecasting. They and, definitely are. <laughs> uh, and you know how? What's the reason for that? Right there, there, there's inherent, I guess, simplicity because everybody knows how to use Excel. I mean, you know, there, there's going to be different uh, different levels of Excel expertise. Yeah. Uh, but then, but then on the flip side. What are the negatives of, 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 of using just 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 sticking to uh, one uh, solution uh, that's that's frankly not smart enough in, in today's technology when you have things like AI, machine learning, demand sensing, things of that nature, right? Yeah. So so again, I I really like that first question that you asked about about growth. So I'm gonna try to tie this tie this one back to that too. So so I th- I think we're at a point where companies can evolve, yeah. right? They could make better spreadsheets, they could make better they could come up with better ways to forecast yeah they could now think about okay well this you know crazy thing happened now i guess i need to reach my safety stock levels yeah and i'm going to continue planning the way i have yeah that's great that's growth that's evolution however i think we are probably at a place where for some businesses it might be the right time to hit a reset button and understand yeah. well how do I want to do this? Am I okay continuing to have the challenges where my calculations, my you know, everything I have in my model makes so much sense to me? But when it comes to reality, one month I'm over, one month I'm under <laughs> on a seasonal basis. Maybe it's okay. Maybe annual basis it's okay. But yeah, you know what 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 good is having the right annual number if you're yeah. On a month by month basis, you're either not meeting your customer's demand, losing revenue, or incurring a lot of additional costs because you're 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 trying to make you're making and storing product that you're not going to be able to sell. So so what I mean when uh, about the reset button is yeah, there is a lot of technologies out there that weren't available to to smaller businesses very recently. I mean, just just going back five, six years, right? There, there, there's a lot of technology out there that 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 could help businesses make the right decisions, understand what their demand might be, uh, yeah. learn, you know, plug into real-time metrics, uh, get real-time data, make smart, reasonable decisions as opposed to going by whim and going by, 
you know, that old example of driving, looking at the rear view mirror, looking at yeah. the historicals, right? So, yeah. so long-winded answer with a lot of ex- examples, but I hope, I hope, I hope it covered what you were looking for. That definitely covers, and uh, you know, it's a very good answer. So now let's talk about your comment uh, related to the Excel, and that's probably the state of the uh, majority of the SMB company that we typically come across. You know, uh, the supply chain, as we all know, supply chain is very, very deep to be able to forecast accurately and to be able to plan accurately obviously the supply chain needs to be a little deeper than most people realize inside the companies but in most cases a planner is sitting somewhere in the corner they are simply trying to forecast something on the excel they have no visibility into what is happening i mean they might have a little visibility into sales but in general there is a lot of misalignment overall in the way companies operate you know sales is trying to do something they are simply going to say hey uh, supply chain guy or the planner, I am looking for this, you know, this is your demand, just go figure it out. I want to make sure that I have the product when I have the orders. This is how the process goes, right? What mm-hmm. I have personally seen, you know, with these companies, there are going to be a lot of issues because of the the expectation misalignment. And when I say expectation misalignment, it's not just the soft issue, okay? It's a very hard issue in terms of the way the planning works. For example, let's say if sales is trying to communicate to their customers, Okay, this is the product I am trying to sell. So they may have, let's say, the model number that they are trying to communicate. Now you are planning at the SKU level, okay? You have the item number or the SKU or whatever, you know, you are trying to plan based on that. Now, marketing is trying to do something. Customer service is trying to do something. They are trying to communicate based on the model number. In the back end, you don't really have any sort of correlation between your model or whatever, you know, they are trying to communicate Mm -hmm. with the customer. And they might be communicating the SKU as well, but sometimes they might be interchanging whether they are trying to communicate using the model or SKU. And obviously that is actually going to throw your planning off because you are trying to plan based on SKU and you are trying to find out, okay, what is my correlation with the SKU and model number? And there is no correlation because these two data sets don't tie together. You know, one is manually managed and one is really your inventory. Have you seen similar issues in your industry because of this expectation misalignment among people? Yeah, yeah. So so, so one thing that we experienced, you know, data accuracy is, is obviously very, very important, right? Yeah. I, think, I think a lot of companies are, a lot of companies, frankly, in a lot of industries are probably dealing with similar challenges in the sense that uh, not, not, not necessarily having a good handle on what are the key components that are going to be needed to, 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 to conduct the, the job. Their, their, their bill of materials probably are, are you know, not, not, not very accurate. Yeah. They may have made some changes in the, uh, into the manufacturing process, gained efficiencies over time, uh, even you know, approved alternate uh, raw materials uh, that might not be reflected there. Right? So, so I think w- while we haven't experienced that issue ourselves, uh, that wouldn't surprise me that 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 a lot of companies have right so so one thing kind of going back to correlation between a product to another product the example yeah. that you gave i mean yeah. w- w- one thing that uh, we experienced or the building materials ex- industry has experienced over the uh, over the past two years and frankly this happened earlier on uh, maybe about 10 years or so also uh, yeah. when when there were tightnesses on on lack of availability on on, on some steel components or you know steel you have for a specific footprint for a specific kind of building yeah you should expect it's like baking a cake in yeah. order to bake a cake i have my recipe is i need one unit of this two units of this yeah. three units of this right? yeah building you know a building is the same way for let's say it's a warehouse i pr- typically need one unit of this, two units of this, three units of that, right? Yeah. So, so your forecasting system could, and this goes back to uh, what we were talking about, forecasting at a SKU level versus forecasting at 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 at, at an aggregate level. Yeah, you probably have a good sense of how many square foot of building you're you're going to be working on. Yeah, build yeah. like I'm using it as the most uh, you know high level like u- unit is square foot of building, right? Yeah, yeah, and and. You know, according to your historicals, and nothing has, let's say, changed in terms of building efficiencies or green initiatives that that, that would make uh, that, that that would put more emphasis on certain products. Let's say everything has stayed the same. Yeah. You should expect that same ratio of products to be applied for a building that's one square foot and a building that's two square foot should be two x that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden, let's say due to artificial challenges or, or artificial uh, supply dynamics, similar to what we discussed earlier, yeah, you start now seeing components that uh, should be selling as one unit 
is now selling at, at two units. And all yeah. of a sudden, your yeah. ratios are totally upside down. So I think I think it's critical to understand what drove that, right? So 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 I think I think a good business, I think a, I'm when I, when I say good business, I, th- I think a big enough business with the yeah. right amount of people. Yeah. Because re- I mean, this is all resources, right? Yeah. Or, or the right systems should be able to flag those things coming up based on uh, the industry insights they have, based on the research that they're. But let's say you're a smaller company, and all of yeah. a sudden uh, you're, you're you're seeing your uh, ratios, uh, pull through ratios for product one, uh, product A, a to B, uh, to be double what what it was. It's critical to understand why that happened, right? right. Asking questions, speaking to your customers, it takes time, but it prevents making the making the wrong decisions. Because God forbid you continue making double X when if this was just the beginning of a massive change, and all of a sudden you're going to need six X. Yeah. Or again, God forbid you now make two X, and it was just a blip on the radar. Yeah. And you're supposed to really have one X. I mean, you know, another article that I that I read was talking about in the U.S. Three percent. There's only three percent available warehouse space right now. Hmm. So what does that mean? I mean, it's all it's all part of cost of goods sold, right? You know, right, if you right. want an f- efficient business, you need to take into account all of the costs. Yep. So I think uh, at a at a at a low interest rate environment, uh, in my, investing in working capital yeah. was probably a good idea for a lot of businesses. Yeah. Make the inventory. We will sell it, right? Yeah. However, on the flip side, there are other challenges that when you look at it from a more macro perspective, companies are not able to find spaces to store their products, right? Yeah. So making the right demand and supply decisions are just going to become that much more critical because yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a very delicate balance on a, on a, on a knife's edge where you it can make that. too much and, and, and not be able to store it and potentially have to sell it at a loss. Yep. Or you ha- you don't have enough to to generate the revenues. I agree, and great examples, by the way. So that's it for today. Do you have any last minute closing thoughts or remarks for our listeners? Yeah, yeah. So so first of all, thank you very much. This was actually the first uh, podcast interview of this sort that I did. So so th- th- thank you very much for having me and uh, you know having this free flow conversation that was very fun and casual. So so in terms of closing co- uh, closing you know thoughts, I think I think you know, some of the themes uh, in our in our discussion were around trying to improve and and reinvent things right so so yeah. so, I, so i think i think we're at a good place in in history where companies can invest in themselves and and lean forward learn from the challenges and uh you know it's not it's not just covid think about the Suez canal think about uh, the global trade uh issues uh or global you know trade challenges we had a few years back that that'll probably continue i think we're at a good place where companies can empower their people yeah. democratizing data having the data available to people that are at the at the lowest level of the organization at a decision making right yeah. not necessarily having to rely on your ceos your you know c suite or executive leadership to, to to make decisions data uh, i mean everything that we spoke about in terms of forecasting all relies on data right yeah and and you know a ceo should probably have more of a time dedicated to strategy and running the business and be, getting the business to its ne- next phase versus having to think about about how much of this specific product category we need, right? So, so I think it's a great opportunity for companies to to to, to connect into tools that make this data available and also empowering their their people. And I think it's it's all it's also a, a great time to kind of reconsider like historical norms that we had in terms of manufacturing, yeah. the lean manufacturing, Six Sigma, and things of that nature. They all work. They all worked for years, right? Yeah. A concept like just in time manufacturing, it might not be working perfectly right now, just because you. Uh, additional supply in your in your in your network to mitigate risks but it doesn't mean that we throw these ideas and and have to reinvent things right it's not a revolution but it's an evolution of 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 the industry so that's it i mean connecting building the right infrastructure in place i think is 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 what's going to be the most important for businesses to set themselves apart and separate leaders from uh from from those that are probably not going to perform as well and and shifting uh, their focus on the, their, their 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 employees, giving them more responsibility, more accountability. I mean, we're hearing about the, the the great resignation, or you know, there there's so many names to it, right? People would want to stay at jobs where their decisions matter, right? So 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 I think it's 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 a it's a multi pronged approach for 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 evolving as opposed to trying to you know do everything from scratch. Okay, amazing. And my personal takeaway from this conversation is going to be the supply chain is always uh, very deep. And especially if you are in industries 
such as construction or building materials, the supply chain is going to be even trickier because of the complexity in the sales process, the complexity of the products and the projects that you might be working on. So the best way to mitigate and have your forecasting accuracy is going to be involve your supply chain guy everywhere. The more you are going to involve them, the more insights and the opportunities you are going to find. On that note, Bahadir, I really want to thank you for your time. This has been a powerful episode. Thank you so much, Sam. Great to be here. Of course. Thank you. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Bahadir, Follow and connect with him on LinkedIn. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Colby Young, who shares his insights on the nuances of PO lifecycle and why it is critical for seasonal businesses such as cosmetics. Also, the interview with Lisa Anderson, who shares her insights on why it is important to be directionally correct with sales and operations planning. Also, don't forget to subscribe and respect the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.